um, so as Bob just talked about, the, the talk I'm going to present today is this work being done on thinking about blue carbon, so I'll define what that is, probably not something that uh, everybody's familiar with. And I also want to point out that this is joint work, um, a colleague at uh, RFF, Yuha Sikamaki, and the graduate students and some research assistants at RFF. And we were uh, funded by the Linden Trust for Conservation, the Vicki and Roger Sant Foundation, and also from uh, Resources for the Future in Washington, D.C. So coastal ecosystems, and we want to think about is, you know, are there potentials to get this into red or offset kinds of programs? Before I start, I should say where I come from into this question and, and what my background is. So I'm an economist by training. I have not been one of the scholars who have spent the last 10 years worried about offsets and monitoring, verification, additionality. I don't have that expertise. There's lots of scholars out there that have spent a lot of time thinking about how you would do offsets and how you would set these contracts. I could address some of the questions you might have, but that's not my background. Where I came to this, though, however, was there's lots of talk out there by the NGO community about trying to bring in blue carbon or coastal ecosystems such as mangroves, seagrasses, and salt marshes into the discussions around offsets and uh, for deforestation. So both at many different levels, they're trying to bring these in, whether it be at the international stage arena with Kyoto and the uh, COP agreements, whether it be uh, with bilateral agreements, and I'll talk a little bit about this towards the end of the talk, or uh, even in uh, state efforts here in California. So that's how I, I sort of come to this question. So just to give you some background, and I'm sorry for those of you in the back, this, these slides, the print might be a little bit uh, small, so you can feel free to move up during the talk. Um, there's lots of pictures, so that hopefully that'll help. <laughs> so what are we talking about in terms of the ecosystems? We're thinking about mangrove systems, salt marshes, and seagrasses. So when we, you hear the word blue carbon, those are the ecosystems that we're talking about, the different types of habitats. These systems are very important for many different reasons, not just blue carbon. A lot of them provide uh, important ecosystem services for locals, whether it be nursery habitat for commercial or recreational fisheries, uh, mangroves, the root structure. It provides nursery habitats and also avoidance from predators. The, the fish can go there when they're younger and avoid the larger predators, for example, out on the reefs. So they provide very important habitat uh, with respect to commercial and recreational fisheries, shoreline protect protection, and uh, pollution filtration. At the same time, these habitats have global uh, importance. And so the, what I'll talk about today mainly is this carbon sequestration and storage. And essentially, when you think about these habitats, as you'll see when I get down to the data, a lot of the carbon has been built over thousands of years and is stored in the soil, right? And so here's a nice profile of a salt marsh or where you see potentially thousands of years of buildup of carbon as decaying material basically settles down and uh, forms the soil bed. I'll also come back to this idea that these habitats also on a global scale provide biodiversity and potentially lots of other cultural services. And we'll think about some of the ancillary benefits if you target things for carbon in these habitats, what are the potential gains you might get in terms of some of the other biodiversity measures? Right? As, as I said, they provide uh, critical habitat for uh, species. So what is the motivation? I gave you a little bit of this already. Uh, there's a potential, as you'll see, that these systems can have significant amounts of carbon storage, especially given how small a footprint they have in the globe. Uh, there's been a lot of literature coming out in the natural sciences trying to measure that right now, and then we'll build off of that. Um, also, there's lots of developmental pressures on these ecosystems and these coastal areas. And like I said, there's lots of talk right now about trying to get them integrated into these discussions, of whether it be reduced emissions from deforestation or, or red, adding degradation, uh, into these carbon offset discussions. Obviously, there's benefits for offsets. You guys, I'm sure there's experts in this room know this, you know, the low cost emission options. Um, and as you know, there's being discussed. 
At the same time that we're, we're developing these conversations, we've got offsets occurring and thought about them, we don't know much about whether or not it makes sense from an economic standpoint to think about carbon offsets. You know, what is the price of carbon coming out of these ecosystems? If the price of carbon is so high that it's not going to be realistic in any market sort of system, then maybe these conversations aren't really worth the effort right now. But it could turn out that, in fact, actually it could be very economically profitable to be thinking about offsets coming out of uh, these systems in general. So that's what we try to do. That's really the crux, this last bullet point of what this uh, research is about. So just to give you an example of the different pressures on these ecosystems, you know, they're being converted, and, and different parts of the world have different pressures. Uh, you can go into aquaculture or mariculture for shrimp farming. Agriculture is a big uh, conversion factor for these coastal systems, development, obviously, and pollution. Estimates vary around the world about what's the rate of loss of mangroves. They go from 0.7 to about 2% annually. So that's the sort of deforestation rate, the loss of these habitats. That's mainly, as you'll see in this talk, while we really would like to do this out of blue carbon, like seagrass, salt marsh, and mangrove, a lot of the data is mangrove. Um, and I'll point out some of that and where we need to go in the future if we really want to think about this. And obviously, when we do these different activities, uh, we release carbon that's stored in the biomass and soils, and we also prevent further accumulation over time. And the question is, how, how big is that, uh, and what's the economics associated with it? So there's the question. Is there economic potential for a blue-red? And the answer is going to depend on a couple of factors that we're going to try to tease out in this analysis. The first one is, what is the avoided emissions per hectare from blue carbon? And then what's the opportunity cost of protecting that, these hectares, right? So if you're going to protect the mangroves, you have to understand what the other uses that could have that mangrove habitat been used for, right? That's what those opportunity costs are. Sorry, I can see people. I'll try to stand over to the side. And then finally, you have to understand a little bit about what's the price per ton of carbon that we might see in the marketplace. You know, are these things going to be valuable for people to go off and do? And we'll use uh, some prices from the ETS, the European Trading Scheme, to give us some range of prices we might see. The key to understanding, especially these first two points, is that there's lots of geographic variation across the globe, both within a country and across countries. And so what we do is we, we undertake what really turned out to be this Herculean effort about doing this global assessment of trying to understand the economic potential. And so what we've done is essentially is we're going to break things down by nine by nine parcels or uh, kilometer parcels, which are our grid cells, which means that we have over 25,000 different grid cells where you could potentially do an offset project scattered throughout the globe. Okay, so it turned out to be uh, much more data intensive than I think we thought of at the original. But that's critical if you want to think at this level, this global assessment, what are the potential economic uh, benefits from following these kind of programs. So as I said, global assessment turned out to be a lot of data and analysis. We had to understand things about the avoided carbon emissions per hectare. So, okay, how do you do that? Well, first thing you got to know is what the carbon is per area, right? So what, how did we do this? We went around and did a lot of literature reviews. We did a, a meta-analysis of the amount that is the scientists think determined in soil carbon, and that varies around the globe depending on the different types of mangroves, the soil, the environments, etc. Okay, so that's getting to sort of what the carbon stock is. Now the question is to get at, you know, avoid it, you have to understand, well, what's the amount of the carbon stock that's at risk? And to do that, we went around and collected data from the FAO on country-level deforestation rates specific to mangroves. Okay, and then the next question you have to ask, so that gives us some measure potentially at risk. The, the final piece of this is what happens when you develop the mangrove? So what is the carbon that's going to be released from a disturbance? Whether, and of course that's going to depend. If you take a mangrove, you cut the trees down and you put a pavement, a parking lot over it, maybe you're not going to release all that much. You'll lose the future accumulation, but the release might not be much. If you're doing a development where you're really getting into the soils and moving soils around, you could have a significant release of carbon. So that's going to vary by type. And what we'll do in our analysis 
is we'll just have a range of assumptions to give you some sense of how that plays into the whether or not these things are economically potential or not. So that's one side. That's really getting back at what are these avoided emissions per hectare, the kinds of data we need. The next thing we have to think about is, well, what's the cost of avoiding the emissions? What's the opportunity cost associated? So unfortunately, there's very little land price data around the globe to do a global assessment. Obviously, certain countries have much better data on land prices than others. So what we tried to do is we went into the literature and we found uh, the best spatially uh, data set we could that looked at agriculture. And we took that and we did some calibration with some World Bank, bank country estimates to, to make sure that these numbers jive. And then essentially what we found is with this data set, we had about 38% 30, of our grid cells had data on the opportunity cost of land. Okay, and that opportunity cost of land, as you can tell, is coming out of what it's used for agriculture, right? What are the, the returns you would get if you converted that over to the agriculture? And that varied by country, and the World Bank uh, allowed us to capture the different types of agriculture. It also included rangeland uses. So then we took that raw data and we used some spatial averaging simple techniques to basically increase our coverage up to about 95% of the mangroves in the analysis. So there's a little bit that we don't capture. There's also, uh, for some small island nations, there's just not data available on the mangroves within them. So that's one piece of the cost of avoiding. That's what you could have done, the best available use for that land, uh, outside of protection. But then we also had to include, well, what's the cost of protecting? Right? There's going to be outlays every year, and there'll be set up costs associated. So we, we built those in, and these actually uh, uh, come from the literature. There's some pretty just good analysis on the cost of setting up protected areas. So where am I going to walk you through now? Just sort of goes through. So that gave you the data, and now we'll just walk through the different types of analysis we did. So I'll, talk, I'll illustrate the coverage of mangroves uh, globally. I'll show you how nice uh, we've got a new data set that came out and how fine the resolution is of this data. Um, then I'll talk about the mangrove, uh, the stock of mangroves, um, whether what's above ground and below ground. And then we'll talk about the, the supply curve of mangrove offsets. That is, what would... Uh, and you, had, you developed a market that allowed mangrove offsets, what would be the supply curve? What would be the price of it as you varied how much reductions you were trying to take out of, the, out of mangrove ecosystems? Obviously, if you take very little, you can get the low-cost options out there, so the price will be low. But as you push the limit out farther and farther, the price should increase. And the question is, you know, how great and is that price increase, and, and when does it uh, become uh, not economically profitable? So we develop those supply curves, and then we start to ask some questions about them, one of which is there's a lot of discussions in the literature and the, around offsets about who bears the risk, right? So the idea here is that these offsets accrue actual emissions reductions. And in California, we have one idea essentially where the buyer is potentially going to bear that investment risk. And so this is the question that comes out then, so we're doing this global assessment, but if I was a someone who was going to decide where to invest the offsets, and I was going to bear the risk about whether or not they actually resulted in actual emissions reductions, that might change my perspective of what is truly in the market for what I consider uh, quality offsets. And the way we do that is we take our global supply curves and we look at them with governance effectiveness rankings out of the World Bank, which is sort of a proxy for investment risk. risk. That is that Governments that are least effective might be places that have higher risk of investment and offsets, so you might want to exclude them from your consideration. And the question is, when you start to do that kind of analysis, how does that affect the economics of blue carbon? Because some countries now won't be part of the supply, right? You'll just take them out because they're just too high a risk uh, to invest in them. The next thing we ask is this idea about, well, let's say you are going out and we know that these uh, habitats have many different values, but you were just thinking, I'm just going to target blue carbon. Well, what does that mean for the ancillary benefits associated with biodiversity? Do you, you know, if you just go after carbon, blue carbon, do you get a lot of biodiversity gains? And if you wanted, for example, to say, well, 
let's design offsets that focus on biodiversity gains first and then carbon second, what are the potential additional costs of doing that kind of strategy? If you had blue, these, these ideas of uh, blue carbon offsets. And then I'll, I'll come back, with, oh, I do a little bit of robustness checks on some of our data. And then I'll come back and discuss offsets and the potential for blue carbon under the current uh, structures. Uh, and what are some of the issues uh, if you want to move forward with thinking about this. So this is the blue, uh, blue, <laughs> the green is the mangroves that exist around the world to highlight. I also want uh, to show you data on seagrass. I'm not sure you can see this in the back, can you? It's sort of an orangey, burnt red kind of color. But that gives you some idea that the mangroves and seagrass, obviously, and then this brings them together, there's some overlap, but there are some areas, mangroves just don't exist up at the higher latitudes. And so up in um, some of the areas in Europe, you're not going to get the overlap, but down in Africa and Indonesia, the Southeast and the Caribbean and Mexico, there is definitely overlap. Okay, that gives you some idea of where they are. Now I'll just uh, zoom in on a couple of places just to see the, the resolution of the data from the, that's out there. So this is the Bahamas. And so this is the, I think this is, if I'm right, this Abaco. And you can see the, diff the resolution that you have from this data on actually where mangroves occur which is quite important, obviously, when you're thinking about the different offsets and the potential uh, amounts of carbon storage. South Florida in the U.S. has got a largest concentration, just to highlight that. And then the largest amount of mangroves is in Southeast Asia and Oceania. And that'll be an important thing to think about, especially when we think about governance issues and what's the potential supply or lack thereof when you bring in the idea of investment risk into the discussion. Here's uh, Borneo. And then one of the other things we did is, okay, so that's the mangroves. You can't see this at all, but trust me, uh, there's red here. And the red are protected areas. So one of the things you had to do is you had to go back out and say, well, there's some mangroves that are already protected. And using <laughs> da da GIS data on the boundaries of these protected areas, we netted them all out of our analysis. So about 4% of the mangroves worldwide are currently under protection. And obviously those would not satisfy additionality issues, right? They're already protected. So we wanted to make sure we took them out. Um, and if you could see this figure, which you can't, you would see that there is some red in here that's overlapped with some of the mangroves. We did this by using uh, the data available on protected areas around the world. So these, these squares, then, are that 9 by 9 grid cell. And we've got these grid cells now for everywhere around the world where there are mangroves. And we're going to come up with measures of the opportunity cost to land and the carbon storage for each of those grid cells. And then we're going to build out of a very simple sort of back of the envelope Excel spreadsheet kind of thing supply curves. There's no fancy math uh, involved. But that's the idea. So, you know. I don't even remember, I think it's 25,000 approximately grid cells. But that gives you some sense of how we divided up uh, the world. Okay, so this is then getting into some of the results with respect to just the area of blue carbon habitat. And where possible, I've given you some uh, numbers to help ground it. So total global forest area is about 4 billion hectares. Mangroves are 13.9. So, you know, you can think about 0.35% of all global forests are mangroves or 0.7% of just tropical. In terms of their uh, coverage, seagrasses are much more extensive than mangroves and then uh, salt marshes. This is just the habitat areas themselves, not the carbon yet. In terms of where the top countries are, Indonesia, Australia, so that's that southeast, uh, Asia, Oceania, Mexico, uh, so the green here is mangroves, blue is seagrass, just gives you some sense of percent of total, but really Indonesia is a dominant uh, location for mangroves, and as it turns out, uh, blue carbon. So here's uh, the carbon stock per area, and this is tons per hectare. So uh, mangroves 
has the carbon stock. And so the dark blue, I, I hope you guys can see that distinction back there, is what's in the biomass, right? You can think of that as above ground in the leaves and the bark. And then there's what's in the soil, is the, the lighter blue. So mangroves, you can see, has about 500 tons per hectare on average around the globe as a carbon stock, but a significant share of that is in the soil, right? Salt marshes and sea grasses, you can't even see the sliver that's the biomass. It's all based in soil. And that's going to be a potential issue right now because there's questions about how soil and soil carbon is being considered in a lot of these offset programs. So we'll come back to that. Having said that, when you look across storage, across different types of forests, mangroves, in fact, are very carbon rich. So here's data that came out of a paper in Nature Geoscience. So mangroves over here, this is just looking at one region, just to give you some sense. So this is above ground, uh, is the clear. This is soils 0 to 30 centimeters. Right? That's important because that's the current level that's considered for CDM and joint implementation programs. They're only looking 0 to 30 centimeters. But you can see as you go much deeper and below that, that's where a lot of the, the mangrove uh, carbon is being stored. And that's just over uh, thousands of years. So even though they have a potentially very small footprint in terms of overall habitat, when you actually look uh, at their carbon content, because of the soil carbon, they actually have a significant amount. They actually, and you start to go, wow, okay, maybe we should pay attention to thinking about these. So this is just the global carbon stock, uh, billions of tons now. So that was, an, oh, I showed you before it was the average per hectare. Now it's just, this is a global estimate for about seven billion tons uh, in mangroves. So salt marshes and sea grasses, to be all honest, this data is really, there's a lot of uncertainty. Mangroves, were, we've got a lot more work done in natural sciences that we can draw from. I question a lot of the salt marshes and sea grasses. It's getting better, but I wouldn't put too much weight on, on some of those numbers. So this is now, that's the stock. If you thought about what would be potentially emitted based on the deforestation rates, right? The idea that these things are being, the habitats are being lost. If you think about global emissions, and this is in millions of tons, um, deforestation from global deforestation is about 1,200 uh, million tons per year. Total blue carbon across all habitats is around 42 million tons carbon or 154 million tons CO2. This around is in italics because we're, we're summing what's in no mangroves, which we think is better quality data than what occurs in salt marshes or seagrasses. But it just uh, gives you some sense of the overall size of, of what we're looking at here. So taking our grid sizes, we can, of course, then go back out to a country level and just give you some summary figures. Here's the carbon stock by country. So the darker the red, the greater the carbon stock. You can't read the numbers, but the darkest red is greater than 2 million. The lightest pink is from 0 to 25 million tons. That's, in this, that's the stock of carbon. And as you can see, there's variation around the globe. Um, but mainly, as you see, it's in the, the Southeast Asia area. So we're going to go from this stock of carbon. Now we've got to do that next step and figure out what's the at-risk amount of that stock. So what is potentially going to be uh, disturbed, emitted by uh, some development, for example, conversion of the habitat. So the first thing you, you want to know when you do, you're in this offset literature, there's a lot of discussion about avoided emissions obviously aren't equal to the total carbon stock. As I said, we need to think about the deforestation risk because that's going to determine the probability that the stock is released out in the atmosphere. And then there's only a portion of that will be emitted. Don't worry about my equation. So the question is, how do you deal with total avoided emissions? How do you give credit? So the simple example we did, don't, you don't have to worry about the numbers, is we looked at it 25 years. And say that you had a deforestation risk of 1%, and you had 100 hectares, right, that you were going to, you could purchase and protect. Yeah, the way we allocated the offsets over time was 
in the first year, you take your 1%, you multiply it by 100, and you get the credit that exists in one hectare. In the second year, you've got 99 hectares left, right? But you still have that 1% risk, so you have 1% of 99. And we did that out 25 years to figure out what the total credit you would give be given for that particular uh, area protected, which is sort of standard within the literature about how do you go and think about uh, this risk over time and what the overall uh, emissions would be. It's a very simple way to do it, and you know, as far as how it affects what we've done, we have many different assumptions, and you could easily, and we have, tweaked it to get some sense. So it's just a, how we thought about this idea of going from at risk in a given year to what are you actually getting credit for over time when you buy these offsets. And like I said, there's probably uh, five people who have spent the last 10 years just worrying about this issue. What's the right way to do this calculus? We just tried to do a very simple way to illustrate this global assessment. So we go now, we can then take this global thing and look at emissions. So let me go back quickly and look at stock to give you some sense where the dark red is. You can look here in Africa and uh, Southeast Asia and also Mexico. So this is the stock level. Now when you actually look at the, what's at risk in these local pla in these places, what's now dark red are the ones that are at most at risk. That varies now. It's not just your total carbon stock you have to worry about, but it's also the rate of deforestation and habitat conversion in the different countries. I just have a question. So sure. Is this all about uh, releasing stock, or is it also about conserving CO2? Are you, you we take into account what you the loss accumulation that you would get if you converted that also. Okay, That's so right. That, that, so it's also, so you're just, so you're taking account of what the future absorption will be at the same time you're taking Exactly. Okay. So there's two things you lose, right? You, oops, sorry. Uh, where am I? Yeah, you lose when you convert a habitat. You lose the stock, potentially, right? And then you also lose the future accumulation. And our measures are doing both of those. We're taking both of those account. But we're we're looking at a 25-year horizon. So as you can tell, this this shows that the variation now will differ because not every there's not a uniform uh, notion of things being deforested in different areas. But again, as I keep saying. We'll come home to this Indian, Indonesia, the Southeast Asia question. Okay, so I'm trying to build up a story slowly, piece by piece. I've got you to emissions. That's question one. They're piece one of answering our question. Now we want to go from those emissions to the supply curve of offsets. So we need to think about this opportunity cost um, and what is really at, at risk here. So we do this a number of ways. The easiest thing we do is we take the assumption that there's a deforestation risk for mangroves in a particular country, let's go back to let's say 1%, and we say that all the grid cells in that country are subject to that 1% at risk. So it basically it's uniform. Every, th every grid cell in that country is at risk of losing 1% of its mangroves and stock in a given year. Now that's very simple, right? That's, so that's the base case we do. And I'll introduce different ways of thinking about uh, that idea, right? It might be that, in fact, actually, offset markets don't work that way, that offset markets look at and they try to find the lowest priced availability. And so they're only targeting certain areas. It could be that land uh, deforestation of mangroves is driven by uh, the opportunity cost of land itself. And so areas where land prices are high could be subject to development pressures. So they might be more likely to be converted and at risk. Or it could be the opposite. It could be low profitability areas are being converted, the fringe of the agriculture. So we'll do all those different robustness checks to think about how does that affect the, the price of carbon coming out of blue, the uh, price of blue carbon offsets. We take all this data, then we just sort of align things uh, based on these targeting assumptions and solve a very simple problem of what the global uh, supply would be. And here's what it is. So on the vertical axis, we have dollars per ton. That's, everything's in CO2. You have CO2 on the bottom. The different cases that are, are based on uh, things coming out of the literature. So the high here deals with high soil carbon content. The low is a, a low estimate of soil carbon content and we take a central one. 
and what you can see rather strikingly is that for a lot almost all of what's available depending on your assumptions of soil carbon content you are below the ten dollar price which was the price the lowest price that was observed in the EU ETS in, in 2011. This band is all the prices. So they've basically gone between $10 and $20. So this says that there's actually an economic potential. If you've got a price of $10 and you could get a, the same thing for around $250, if you did an offset for blue carbon, well, that's actually something that might be attractive to think about. And before we did this exercise of putting all this data together, there really was no global estimates of, or thinking about what is the economic potential of this. Okay, so now what I'm going to do is just now sort of play with this analysis and go through some of those scenarios I talked about. The first one we'll do is we'll just break it down by uh, regions just to see what the supply curve looks like in the different regions. And we just broke out the Americas, Caribbean, Africa, Middle East, and then Asia, Oceania. So I'll do those supply curves by region now. And hopefully you can see this in the back. But this is Americas and Caribbean. Um, again, the color is red is the low estimate. Black is the high. That band is the price is observed. So what this does tell you is that basically all of the blue carbon in the Americas and Caribbean that's available, that is at risk, falls under the $10 price. There's not a lot in terms of quantity but all of it is pretty low cost option. Africa and the Middle East, you've got a couple low cost options, but then once you get close to the boundary, prices start to skyrocket. Um, and you can imagine some of that's coming out of the Middle East, right, where land prices can be uh, quite high. And then Asia, Oceania is really where that global supply is coming from in terms of overall quantity, right? Like if you can look here, this is the global one again, you can see, as I said, a lot of it's coming out of Asia and Oceania. Just to give you some variation of how you, you know, come to those global supply curves. They're really being built out of those nine by nine kilometer grids. Uh, that's the basis that we're building up you know, this global. And we can do this by country, we can do it by uh, region, et cetera. Okay. So now these different scenarios. The first one looks at uh, the role of risk and investment risk. And this idea of using, there's way, many different proxies we can take. Uh, we just look at the effectiveness of governance that the World Bank uh, has. They have some rankings. So, uh, and here's just a map of it. So basically, um, countries that are in dark red are in the top 50 percent quartile. Bottom 50 is pink. Can you see pink back there? But that's basically this. And the hash is the bottom 10%. So these are countries, for example, if we said that the investment risk is so great, we're not going to consider countries in the bottom 10th quartile, those hash countries would go out of our analysis. They wouldn't be part of the global supply curve anymore. Okay? We'll also take out the bottom 50%, which, as you can see, takes out some of the area in the southeast, but really mainly uh, takes out uh, Africa. Right, and so this is just thinking about, well, while this is a nice picture of what the global supply curve is, maybe in, in realistic terms, that's not really what it is. Right? When you take into account the, the insights and intuition of investors and how they're thinking about investing in offsets. And so what we find is that the black line here is all of them. It says the top 90 are included, so we exclude that bottom 10, and the green dash is when we we exclude the bottom half. So not surprisingly, when you exclude the bottom half, you lose a fair amount, right? What's interesting in the Americas and the Caribbean, and maybe it's not surprising once you see it, but there's actually virtually no change um, in the amount of carbon available, right? We're basically, in terms of the governance effectiveness, if that's your proxy, that there's very little change. Africa, as I said, you essentially lose it um, based on if at least if you're the bottom 50, and even Asia and Oceania, you're having a significant drop if that's your, if you're just worried about that investment risk, it could reduce the potential size of this carbon market substantially, or the offset market. So all these ideas that we're doing, these sort of tests and thinking about this are all sort of trying to tease out 
all the different arguments that you hear in the literature and what their potential importance uh, is for this kind of analysis. Quick question. Before yeah, we sure. Have. Please, I feel like I'm go, go, go. Seems like a bigger risk than, say, weak governments is uh, these are all coastal ecosystems with sea level rise. IPCC has estimates over the next 80 years of some significant sea level rise. These are right at sea level. So potentially many of these ecosystems are going to be under water in 50 years. Or So <clears throat> have you looked, and your GIS later, layers would be great for being able to go ahead and take a look at how many acres are lost due to 5 foot of sea level rise, 10 foot. I mean, that, I think you're going to lose a huge amount of acres. We already know that global emissions are going up faster than <coughs> the last IPCC assessment. That's a great question, and we haven't, can you believe it? We haven't done that. But I actually agree with you, and we've been talking about doing it. There's, there are some issues, though, that you're going to, it's, but there's assumptions everywhere in this kind of work. The question is, is, it depends on what's behind these habitats currently, whether or not they can migrate up with the change. And so I, I haven't gotten into how detailed these estimates, the soil, or, or the, or sea level rise are, and, but we could do it. We haven't. But I agree. I think it would be a nice thing to do, and we're, all we have to do is do some match and merge, and we run. Yeah, there's a question. If sea level does rise, It's a good question. I think it would depend on storm action, where they're not, where it's getting released or not. There is some talk that mangroves, certain species of mangroves, have some thresholds to be inundated at certain levels of the roots. So it's not clear how. This is the issues, right? And then, um, even with sea level rise, unless it's sea, going over into a parking lot, we're going to have salt marshes and seagrass beds. They'll just be in new places. But you're a good question about what happens to all that storage. And I, I guess I, I, it depends on the storm action in the area, whether or not it's going to get distributed and, and emitted. I don't know how to answer that. There's a question up here? Yeah, you go. Oh, good. OK. Um, so when you talk about risk in terms of government, is this the idea that the government is going to abide by the rules that protect these lands? Well, that's right. I mean, there's many ways to think about what are the risks a buyer of an offset, right? And this is why third parties are coming up. and. They're trying to do the verification and the monitoring and the measuring and all that. Is that, you know, in California, for example, it's the way I understand it, and I'm not an expert, and someone in this room might have written a rule, so I'll say that right now, uh, is that you're required to put some of your offset into sort of an offset pool. So you're basically buying more than what you would have bought, and you put some into a pool to sort of, as an insurance or risk sharing among all people buying offsets as a way to kind of ensure that y you're getting actual emissions, even though you, you know, you, your particular project might not meet its intended target. So in thinking of it that way, where the buyer is bearing the risk of this, if I was a buyer of offsets, I was a third party, you know, there are certain countries that just don't have stability in the government, you know, not going to be there. I'm not going to be able to get into a long-term contract where I'm going to get access to the data and then be able to monitor it. And so you might have that calculus going on in the background where then they just focus on particular countries. Um, and so that's what we did. We treat that as fixed, right? And that you would, and that's the intuition for it. There's many other measures we could have used as proxies, but that's the idea, just so to give someone a sense. Stability. Essentially, that's what we're, yeah. Okay. So all the areas within effective governments are probably the areas that <coughs> have uh, you know, lower economic levels and less development pressures. Do the two offset each other in any kind of a way? So I'll say that again. So let's go back to the well, if you look at the map. Yeah. Uh, you know, probably there's a lot more economic pressure on uh, you know, the South Tip of Florida um, to uh, to do something. I mean, you know, they're built when the yeah. economy picks up again. They're build, going to be building high rises, and there's you know the, the lost revenue by destroying the mangroves would you know be enormous. Whereas if you do it somewhere in Micronesia, you know, probably not. Okay. That's, so, yeah, the flip is that is that there's not a lot of carbon in some of these. There's not a lot of mangroves total, and so there's not a lot of carbon in total. So you might have these effects, but they not might not be big enough to come out in sort of the global kind of assessment. Is that right? It's, so you've got lots of issues here. So when, so the idea is that the the deforestation risk could be positively related to the government effectiveness is essentially what you're saying, right? 
Right. Well, I'm, I'm saying that the that the um, substitution costs, right, are going to be much higher in the areas where you have effective government. So South Florida, they're going to want to build. You know, Australia, they're going to be. You know, the coastal areas are worth more uh, for for development purposes. And so you, so in a certain sense, yes, it maybe makes you feel better when you go to bed at night because you know there's not going to be a junta wherever you. Uh, on the other hand, you're going to have to pay a lot for that security. So that's doesn't really necessarily get borne out a lot of places. You know, obviously, if a mangrove, you're using the intuition of a mangrove right next to like an urban center where it's beyond that fringe. That's often not the case. Even in South Florida, it's not. It's far enough away. It's more towards the Keys, but it is. Well, like, I use that as an alternative. But it wouldn't generally be the case that yeah. the value of land would be higher in Australia than in the uh, U.S. So we, you know, we use these estimates based on agriculture. And I'll come back and I'll do some robustness okay. checks that bring this in. But to be honest, I haven't. What you want is what I don't have. Is I don't have my robustness checks with the government mapped onto one to one. Okay. And I, I, I understand. I think you're right. We should do that. Okay. So the other thing to think about was this idea: Are there what are the ancillary benefits? So if we follow the biodiversity kind of strategy, the purchasing offsets, what's the additional cost? Um, that you would have to incur to do that. To do that, we use data on species ranges from the IUCN and World Wildlife Fund to develop uh, numbers of species within each of these grid cells. So we took species ranges and mapped them onto the grid cell. And so what I'll show you now is just different pictures. So we looked at mangroves. That's the number of mangrove species um, and where there are different mangrove species around the globe. Uh, so that would just be a, a richness measure with respect to the trees. And then we looked at uh, birds. So darker red is just more. I, I, I'm sorry, I didn't realize how long this room was. Um, we also looked at endangered birds, reptiles, and amphibians. Well, those things we have data for, um, for the different uh, species. So the question is, you know, okay, you follow a strategy where you want to target offsets in places where you're most likely going to get a big gain uh, in terms of the birds' uh, biodiversity. And what is the cost of following those kinds of strategies? So what this is now, this is CO2 again, and this is not a supply curve in the sense that this is the difference in the budget in millions of dollars. So that is, if you were targeting two tons of CO2, two million tons of CO2, um, and you follow the biodiversity strategy, your budget or the amount of money spent on offsets would be something on the order of $1 million more than what you already are spending. And essentially, as you get further out in the amount of offsets, that difference in budget gets up around $20 million, uh, $30 million. And we did this, so the green line is just mangroves. This is all the species richness. This is just endangered birds. So I look at this and say, that's nothing millions of dollars in what we're talking about, trillion dollar markets, if we ever do end up in a global carbon market. These are nothing. So it says, in fact, it, you know, it has to do a lot with how, how much species richness these habitats already have and that variation. But it does say that for a little bit of money, you could begin to hit other benefits, not just carbon. So I think this is an optimistic story with respect to if that's your focus, looking at these other ancillary benefits. Because in my mind, that's, that's not a lot of money uh, that we're talking about. So here we did some of these robustness checks. Okay, so remember the base case, which is this, what I call uniform, is this blue line. That's the global supply curve where the at-risk amounts of mangroves is spread out evenly within a country. Now we start to say, well, what happens if there's some other kinds of targeting strategies for buying offsets? The lowest cost one is what if you target things based on their carbon costs. So if you basically go around the world buying the cheapest ones first based on the carbon price, and then you build up, and that's that red dotted line. That's the cheapest you could do this at. Okay, so what that also says is that the areas at risk are the, also the ones that have the lowest carbon price. Those two things happen just by coincidence to line up. But that's the lowest price you could get, right, following the strategy. Then we ask the case, well, what happens if all the at-risk 
uh, mangroves were in areas of low land rent or low prices versus high prices of land. How different would that be? Again, just to give us some sense of the robustness of our results, and the, the worst case is the high land prices. So if all the carbon that was at risk was that on the urban fringe, right, that's how much additional budget you, or amount you'd be spending, right? And it's not significant. If you remember that $10 was the lowest ETF, we're still getting almost close to the full amount of at-risk carbon in mangroves before you get up to $10, even at the, the worst-case scenario, the idea that everything aligns with the highest prices. Okay, this next one, Indonesia. So there happens to be some trends going on in Southeast Asia with respect to oil palm. Oil palm happens to be a highly valuable crop, um, and is seeing there's government programs to increase the spread of oil palm throughout. So what we did is said, what happens if in all of Indonesia, all the mangroves were subject to moving into oil palm, which is again, not likely, right? Because oil palm typically likes to grow at upper elevations, but there is some conversion of mangroves. But so this would be the worst case scenario. This is like the highest opportunity cost of land you can get for Indonesia right now is everything's being converted into oil palm. And the question is, how does that affect the, the market? We also did the same, we looked at Thailand because a lot of that is going into shrimp farming. So we wanted to know what are the implications if we took values from shrimp farming or oil palm and, and went to our global supply curve. So this high is the base case that I illustrated earlier with high soil carbon. The red is the base case with low soil carbon. So if you, everything was going to oil palm, essentially prices would, would dramatically change, right? The global picture for blue carbon offsets would be different. And you're basically having this sh inward shift, right? So we went from a price around $2 at six, now we're up to, I don't know, four. And if you're down here, you went from two, and now you already start going up to $10. So that's a significant difference. So what this says to us is, and I'll come back to this, this global assessment was nice in a way of showing us what the overall picture is, but of course we want to get in now and get a really much more detailed picture, especially in places like Indonesia and Thailand, about how deforestation in mangroves is occurring. What are the fundamental drivers and what are the, the true opportunity costs? Because obviously it has a potential large impact on, on the, the economics of uh, blue carbon. So in terms of uh, climate policy frameworks, well, I don't know. You know, if I gave this talk a week from now, I might not have this first bullet up anymore. Um, so there are been conversations at COP 16, 17 uh, about blue carbon. It's been in, people have been trying to get it included in the frameworks. In, uh, and there is an idea that red could provide a basic framework. But there are some issues currently as the international discussions have gone on that have to be addressed. First of all, you have to get mangroves classified as forests. Um, in some places they are, in some places they're not. How do you deal with the soil carbon issue? Because in, for all the blue carbon, once you especially get the salt grasses, or salt marshes and sea grasses, that's where the carbon is. And right now there's differences of opinion about whether or not we should be including uh, soil carbon. So we don't hold out much hope uh, on the international stage, but there are some actual things going on that are exciting. There are these bilateral agreements going on. So Norway now has developed an arrangement with Indonesia um, that is not yet include mangroves, but could potentially. They do have forests and peatlands, and so there's a possibility that we could bring in mangroves within this partnership, right? Where Norway is now essentially buying offsets from Indonesia outside of any general agreement just because they feel like that's the right thing to do. Remember, Norway's a pretty significant producer of oil. Um, so there's potential to bring it into some of these bilateral agreements. Uh, in the EU ET ETS, they do accept the clean development mechanism and joint implementation credits. There's this general idea that they're very skeptical, though, to land-based offsets. They're not included until after 2020. Um, the C 
TDM methodology did accept mangrove restoration, but not avoided deforestation. So right now, it's not set up yet to deal with uh, mangroves. REGI, that's the Regional Greenhouse Gas Initiative in the Northeast, allows afforestation credits, but only in the member states, and there's no mangroves, at least in the member states that I know of. Um, and then there's us here in California. So there's a possibility here, actually. So mangroves could qualify as a credit under RED in AB 32, because forest is defined pretty broadly enough that it does encompass some mangroves. There is international offsets coming online in 2015 and the current uh, plan. And we have an agreement uh, in Mexico, in this region of Mexico, which is down here in red, um, which also happens to have mangroves. So what we did is we said, well, what's the potential here for blue carbon in the, this area in Mexico where California is already signing agreements and already developing ideas of this is one, actually probably will be the, the biggest player initially when international offsets come online, they're already getting the forest lined up and accredited and, and verified, et cetera. So there's potential here. So what we did is we took the region and we said, well, how much mangroves do they have? They have about 192 square miles. They lose about 600 hectares uh, annually. Each of the hectares contain about uh, 936 tons of carbon dioxide that could be released in the atmosphere. And our cost estimate has it about $2 per ton, which is pretty competitive. ARB's got one of their projected allowance prices in 2020 or $25 per ton. What I understand from the forest offsets from this region, their pricing range is somewhere between 15 and 20. So it's a potential that you could, we could use this in California as a demonstration project for blue carbon and how you would go about it, including mangroves into these kinds of systems. And it definitely obviously makes sense from an economic perspective. There's not a ton of carbon here, so it's not going to be that significant in the big picture. You said there's 936 tons per hectare. Per hectare, and you divide it by, there in terms of the tons. global. There are tons, yeah. But in terms of the big cap, it's, it's going to be a small amount. But where it could actually be quite important, though, is this demonstration project. Obviously, you know, California's out front here. We could really demonstrate the use of blue carbon in these offset markets and how you would do it. Um, but there are some barriers. One, the current methodology doesn't consider soil carbon, as far as I know. Um, and as I showed you earlier, if you're just looking at the top here, the biomass and mangroves, it's not really going to compete with the forest. There's some rainforests in this region, um, et cetera. And so unless there's some flexibility here, it doesn't seem like um, it's going to go very far. Also, the protocols under AB 32 don't include salt marshes or seagrasses. And then I just have a bullet here um, that there's issues right now, of course, many of you are aware of with e AB 32 in general, and then offsets and the role of offsets. And so there's just going to be some challenges. And, you know, maybe it's optimistic that, to think by 2015, uh, international offsets will be included. There might be some challenges which might delay it. So there's just broader issues uh, to think about. So where are we at the end of this sort of uh, analysis? Well, we found out a lot of things that uh, we need to know more about, which is always a good thing from research. We realized that there's not a lot of data out about salt marshes, just their geographic distribution, just not very well known, their total area. Um, the loss disturbance rates, what are the drivers of these the deforestation rates that we've got? And then what happens after you disturb them? You know. What you find in the forestry realm is they've got these large forest simulation models, right? That they can play out all these scenarios. These models have been built over hundreds of years around forestry and how to maximize the return from forest productions. Now they're using them to figure out how to model offsets. We don't have that. So when they go through and do a disturbance in their system, they have a pretty good sense of what the releases would be. We don't have that for blue carbon. We don't have that in salt grasses, peat marsh, or I do that again? Sea grasses and salt marshes and mangroves. And then the opportunity and cost of preservation, um, what I illustrated, those robustness checks, we really need to have better information. So we, as I said earlier, I think the next step here is if you want to go forward with this is to do these 
more localized uh, assessments or on a regional basis um, to get some sense of all these different pressures. And then finally, you know, we're just dealing with carbon preservation. We talked about biodiversity, but there's lots of other reasons that you might want to conserve these mangroves. There's the sh shoreline protection from storms. There's pollution filtration. Mangroves provide uh, services with respect to water purification. And as I said, they're very critical sometimes for the commercial and recreational fisheries just offshore of the mangroves. Often you don't fish in the mangroves. You might go crabbing, but you're not fishing there. You're mainly fishing offshore, often in, in the coral reefs. So there's other reasons for preservation that we're not uh, considering in our analysis. And so uh, just to tell you, there's a forthcoming report from Resources for the Future uh, that'll be available publicly, and it should be out within the next couple of weeks. Feel free to contact myself or my colleague at RFF, Yuha, who's the sort of lead author, if you want any more information. But this will be available, and maybe we can have a link on your webpage once it, we get it done. So thank you very much. Thank you.